Now here's a, uh, a clip that uh, I don't think uh, many people would uh, actually have considered that I'd make and I don't think uh, Isel Mazard himself would either make and this is uh, me saying that with regards to his recent clip I believe that he is wrong. Now only from the perspective and this is the little bit of the segment that he was talking about uh, the 25% tax on leather shoes. Now my concern with that is a why on leather shoes why not uh, footballs okay using Australia example we've got uh, Aussie rules footballs uh, leather I believe last time I checked and that was around about late last year is that it actually said in the rules that uh, a match grade football was one made of leather so leather footballs leather furniture uh, car seat covers uh, you know Ugg boots uh, how about leather jackets how about leather vests and things like that so uh, you know, and across the board, percentage, in, you know, tax on leather, whilst it does sound good, I think that if uh, people are getting excited, hey, let's form a, a lobby group to lobby uh, relevant politicians about bringing that in. Unfortunately, I don't think that would ever come across. I don't think that, I do not believe in using Australian as, as an example, I'm not too sure about the political processes overseas, uh, that no politician, regardless of how much money the the claim was going to throw at him and how much money that the tax would go and bring into uh, consolidated revenue, which is you know the big bank that the government uses, it, it wouldn't get up. Now, for that reason being, now going by and these are figures re relevant to Australia as well. Now, in two thousand and thirteen, uh, the leather hides export, so that's green. So as soon as the the animals being killed in the slaughterhouse. I think due to a lot of our uh, environmental laws and things like that, they're just packed in salt and sent overseas, so overseas and processed overseas because the what they call a green tape out here is that the environmental uh, criteria that they have to follow with that is too too restrictive and, and too costly for for it to be for the the hides to be processed here, so they're sent overseas packed in salt. Now that was worth 1.2 billion dollars in 2013. Uh, looking at uh, recent figures, this is I believe from early 2016, so early this year, the average hide that's uh, you know skin from a yearling calf, uh, because that's what a lot of the uh, the animals are sent to slaughterhouses are, they're yearlings, that would range from anywhere from 25 to $28 per hide. Now the thing with this is, this is why animal fletcher is so you know comparatively cheap compared to other things, is that every part of the animal is used and then sent off for someone else so when you're when you're paying twenty five dollars or twenty eight dollars for hide then you're subsidizing the price of the animal flesh so they export tongue uh, all the offal parts a huge market overseas for that uh, so so this is the thing for Isel to turn around and say hey let's bring in a, a 25 percent tax on leather shoes why not go leather boots why not just do across the board all blanket leather goods now going back onto that is that it wouldn't get up because especially uh, with Australia having two major parties either the, the Liberal Party who are allegedly more uh, you know central to right wing though I think party policies from both sides are more central than uh, you know be, being either left or right on the, on the, the political pen, pendulum uh, the the Liberal National Party the co you know, current coalition would never do it because it will be uh, you know, restrictive because supposedly there are about free trade agreements and all that sort of stuff. And this is the other thing too, is that if you impose a tax on leather, then what's the compliance with that with the relative, relevant free trade agreement? So if we're importing something from India or even uh, China, because most of our stuff gets sent over there and then shipped back in, what you know, how will that affect the free trade agreement? Would there be the possibility that it's going to be in breach of the agreement? Uh, the other thing about that is that from there, when we have a look at it, uh, the meat industry is a very powerful industry. Now, I'm just going to pause for a minute. Uh, back again, sitting on the front porch out here and there's a lot of uh, traffic going on the road. I can see the road from where I'm. So, uh, big noisy truck down past. So what I was saying was that uh, a, a tax on leather may uh, you know, be in breach of the free trade agreements and things like that. Now, I'm not sure, I'm not gonna read a whole, Umpteen million page free trade agreement to say, oh, this is how you can get around it. 
Uh, and the other thing too is that the meat industry is a very, very powerful industry. And this is the thing, is that leather is a byproduct of the meat industry. It will also, you know, it supplements the things like that. So, you know, are politicians going to turn around and say, hey, yes, I want to make my shoes 25% dearer? No, they're not. And, you know, it, it'll be the thing that not only will it be seen as a, as a tax on the rich, and this is the bit that will be seen as a, as a tax on the poor as well. And that's something that the media is, and you know, society, Australian society in general, is very, very cautious of and very hesitant to, to allow to happen. So, you know, I, I don't think something like this would actually get up, would even be considered by ministers, uh, any relevant ministers at, at that part. They may say, oh, yes, you know, we'll look into it. You know, that's just paying lip service and, and doing the, the whole, you know, political double speak that they do. And the other thing to note is the, for those who are familiar with Australian politics, the Labor Party is, you know, founded, controlled by the union movement. And looking at the 2014 2015 financial year, the Australian Meat Industry Employees Union, so that's the union that covers. The, the meat industry employees that work in the processing factories and things like that, they donated just under two, or just, yeah, around about $2.25 million to the Labor Party. That was in 2014, 2015. Now, would they be happy to turn around and say, hey, yes, you know, you'll push more jobs overseas because people aren't going to be buying the products here, so we're going to send everything overseas. And, and it's just that, that whole big... Uh, you know, all conflicts and, and everything like that that runs into it. So, you know, fr from that aspect, the the chances of that going out, even if you've raised, you know, $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 to, to spend the time meeting with them, meeting with government and meeting with ministers, and because that's what it is, it's money that they're going to have to do there. You're going to have to find some, you know, donate money to the, the relevant parties and things like that that money would be better spent doing other things. And, you know, what's an example? My my thoughts would be along the lines of, you know, not, uh, you know, not restricting the sales. I mean, I, for that, now going back to this, before I jump onto that, is that we have a look at cigarettes and alcohol in Australia. They increase, I think it's almost every six months or every, every 12 months. So I know there's a Christmas increase or there's increase either just before Christmas or just after Christmas, and then there's a financial year increase where cigarettes, the price of cigarettes and alcohol go up every year. It still hasn't stopped people buying cigarettes and drinking alcohol. There was the uh, alcohol pops tax, I think that, that Kivy Rudd wanted to implement as well. That wasn't gonna stop people drinking alcohol because they'll find money. They will, uh, you know, make their own booze. They'll make their own cigarettes. Uh, I'm not saying people make their own leather. I'm just saying that making an increased tax on something doesn't necessarily stop people buying it. And the other thing too, is that, okay, so let's say, you know, 25% tax goes to consolidated revenue. What is the government gonna do with that money? Uh, you know, will they use, oh no, we'll, we'll siphon it over here. We won't use it to promote uh, plant-based education because that's gonna conflict with the meat industry. And we know that uh, that industry and dairy industry is very, very powerful and contributes a lot of money to government. Uh, look at the CSIRO uh, total wellbeing diet that was you know funded by the meat industry and the CSIRO, CSIRO is supposed to be impartial. So, you know, that is just go to consolidate revenue. So they'd use that to pay for something else, to pay for, you know, whatever else there is. I believe a better thing would be to do would be to uh, lobby government and the school systems to, you know, it, it's harder to do in Australian schools because a lot of the uh, running of canteens have been outsourced now. So they're not run by the schools, they're run by you know, PNC associations or things like that. So it's all voluntary and all that. That would be a better idea is that using, uh, you know, finding a way of having the government subsidized plant-based products. So, I mean, uh, you know, what is it? The the Waikilamu cow pies, for example, uh, I think they're about five bucks each when you go and buy them at West End Markets. Uh, th this is up in Brisbane. You know, if the government was to turn around and uh, remove the sales tax on them or remove something so then the these products were cheaper in, in the school so when in, instead of you know three dollars or whatever it is for a meat you know the traditional four and twenty meat pie or, or parsley or something like that there was this suitable product that's a, of equal value as well so it's not going to be restrictive for the school kids and then you know, introduce them that way 
that would be something better to do and you know influence uh, government that way by saying hey this is what we want in the schools uh, you know you could start with one school and then just build on from there and use that as a trial period uh, you know for that to happen you'd have to get on board with the supplies not only the guy who makes the, the, the meat pies the supplies for uh, that supplies him with stuff so they can make it you know make it cheaper for him to produce and things like that that would be something you know that would be more beneficial than lobbying politicians for a, a you know even a five percent increase on five uh, percent on tax on leather shoes it wouldn't work you know the the luxury car tax when that came out in uh what year? I can't even remember what year that was in that was more acceptable because it was seen as a tax on the rich now unfortunately due to the ever increasing price on cars that hasn't uh increased by you know by the relevant cpi increases and, and all that sort of stuff so Pretty much the luxury car tax. I think that applies to any car over sixty or seventy thousand dollars. So there's the luxury car tax on top of that. So when it was first talked about, it was promoted as a tax on the rich. So it was uh, more acceptable to the to the general public. Now, uh, you know, I'm not saying that that his ideas are wrong without going for taxes and things like that. It's just that you you need to sit down and and work out something where it is, you know, it, it's going to be more palatable palatable. Um, acceptable by the politicians, so it's not going to leave a bad taste in their mouth. They're not going to upset their constituents. They're not going to upset the, the powerful uh, industry groups. They're not going to accept, upset the, the union movement and things like that. Which will what happen is if you put a tax on uh, animal-based products. Now, I'm not saying that it might, you know, it won't happen 10 or 15 years time. I'm talking about right now. The other thing I'd be looking at doing as well is contacting them and you know increasing subsidies for uh for, for fresh food products you know there was that uh kevin rudd did his 900 hundred dollar tv uh bonus is for the uh, financial global financial crisis i mean why can't the government turn around and bring in a coupon scheme out here in australia and say okay uh, there is a, a payment card for social security where you can only buy uh food and some other things on this payment card on this I think it is a, it's a visa card you can't buy alcohol and gambling and all that sort of stuff why not turn around and say yes okay if you buy uh, fresh fruit and vegetables on that then you'll get a further discount on that so your money goes further for buying fresh fruit and vegetables and it will help the you know the, the farmers and all that sort of stuff as well so so this is the other thing that you need to think of I mean there's many other ways you could do it not imposing a tax but more about not making this product more more uh, you know more expensive because people always find money about something why not make the alternative suitable product cheaper so therefore there's there's less re reason for people to go to uh, you know using the whole protein uh, thing you know the wet proteins which is your animal products and things like that why not make the dry protein so like your soy and your grains and all that sort of stuff why not that make that cheaper or you know subsidize it from the government and make it cheaper that way so people aren't as inclined to go to the wet protein because that's the thing and you know i i don't agree with that um you know that's just the mindset i'm talking about the whole wet and dry protein thing because i that makes it uh you know the, oh we need to have this because this has a high protein now well you know we don't so anyway that's a whole different discussion so anyway let me know your thoughts below uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, like, subscribe, and all that sort of good stuff. And remember, don't fear the vegan police. We're here to help.